Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, welcome to the, the session on integrative artificial intelligence, integrative AI. Uh, over the last 25 years or so, we've made uh, in our field uh, significant advances on inference and decision making, um, uh, perception, machine learning, um, speech recognition, natural language processing, even dialogue systems are uh, getting more fluid and flexible. And uh, at, th at the same time, uh, much has been said about the centrifugal trends in AI. Um, vision pulling apart from main AI conferences, ACL being a separate meeting with a natural, a natural language processing, uh, the, speech, the speech conferences, SIG dial, dialogue meetings, and so on. Um, these advances that I mentioned have come at the cost of the separation into these separate societies and communities. Um, uh, at the same time, I've typically celebrated the incredible work going on uh, along these different uh, dimensions of competency from the point of view of the founders of AI. Um, so there's been an interesting um, attention building, especially in people that want to build end-to-end -end systems that uh, accrue or accrete multiple competencies uh, of the form we see, for example, uh, in human beings, listening, uh, understanding, reflecting, planning uh, into larger intelligences of the form uh, closer to the type of, of systems that the founders of AI were thinking about in their initial proposals and reflections. Um, there's a really interesting tantalizing promise of weaving these competencies together, but uh, there's lots of questions about how to do that well, what the outcomes might be, and the promise of this path as one approach to reaching uh, surprises. Uh, unexpected uh, new kinds of experiences and abilities. Uh, we have some really exciting work going on at Microsoft Research on these kinds of systems. Um, uh, we also see this trend uh, among uh, work in the field, uh, uh, among our, our colleagues, who, some of whom are with us today uh, in the audience and will be presenting. Uh, and it's really interesting to see these different kinds of approaches uh, going on. Uh, yesterday, I, in the uh, early morning sessions, uh, we saw uh, w approaches to integration for bringing language and vision together, for example, more deeply and richly in fine, in fine grained representations. That's one approach, but we can also imagine approaches that bring together separate modules that you might say uh, play a symphony of competency together when it's properly coordinated. And we'll hear more about that today as well. So we have three fabulous speakers today, fabulous researchers, uh, leaders in their field, um, all doing what I would call core integrative AI, uh, the science and the engineering of, of that kind of work. Uh, Dan Bohus is a researcher in the Adaptive Systems and Integration Group uh, at Microsoft Research. He's been seeking to develop systems that embed uh, interaction and computation deeply into the flow of everyday tasks, um, and uh, uh, as well as collaborations. His work over the last few years has focused on computational models for multi-party engagement, turn-taking, interaction planning, and core challenges to support this kind of thing in inference, learning, uh, and decision-making. Prior to joining Microsoft, Dan obtained his PhD degree from Carnegie Mellon University, where it wasn't a surprise, he investigated very similar problems uh, of dialogue management and error handling, uh, all in those two, those two dimensions of analysis are very important in his, in his, in his current work. Uh, also heralding, uh, more recently from CMU, like now, is Manuela Veloso, who's the Herb Simon University Professor in Computer Science uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Manuela is, uh, is, has been leading bunches of work in AI and, um, and, and the subfield of, of robotics. She's passionate um, about autonomous agents that collaborate, that observe, reason, act, and learn. She's done some pioneering work in robotics. People probably know of her work in, in RoboCup and in work on collaborative robots, robots that collaborate with people. Cobots is the word she has used or coined for that. Uh, she's an IEEE fellow, AAAS fellow, AAAI fellow, 
And uh, I had the pleasure of working with her um, as the past president of AAAI. Uh, and she's done, of course, uh, she's well known for her work in, in RoboCup as being uh, one of the, uh, the um, I would say, the you know, leading spirit behind RoboCup. Larry Zitnick, uh, you, people here yesterday uh, saw some of his presentations. He's a principal researcher in the interactive visual media group at Microsoft Research. He's interested in a broad range of topics related to visual object recognition, language, and artificial intelligence. He's been an inspirational uh, leader uh, with, I think, your recently awe-inspiring uh, efforts and directions in image understanding, uh, the grounding of imagery with language, um, and uh, I think people here are familiar with his recent work in abstract scenes, the common objects in context, the COCO um, a challenge problem and workload effort, and the image captioning work which stemmed from that effort to put together the COCO data set. Before he, he did some of that work, he, he did some several well-known uh, earlier technologies like photo DNA. Uh, before joining MSR, he received his PhD. Also, I didn't even recognize this when I first looked at these bios, also from CMU. I guess this is a CMU thing, is this, this trend at MSR really holds out. We'll have to start hiring mostly from Stanford in the future years. Uh, I'm sorry. All your schools. <laughs> Uh, with that, let me let me have Dan come up. Come on, Dan. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I'm a researcher here in Adaptive Systems and Interaction, a group here in MSR Redmond. And uh, as Eric mentioned, my work is on physically situated language interaction. Um, basically, the central idea that drives this research agenda is getting machines to kind of look more in their surroundings, into physical space, understand how people behave, and drive interactions with spoken language off of that understanding. So over time, we've done work with you know, virtual avatars that book shuttles on campus and robots that give directions to people's offices and conference rooms and games that engage multiple participants in educational games and so on and so forth. That's kind of the class of systems we've been looking at. But the point that I'm going to try to um, drive home today is that this whole space of physically situated language interaction, I think, can constitute is like a prime example of what we, we might mean by this term of um, integra uh, integrative AI. Uh, because it, you have to bring together components and, and competencies from different realms of artificial intelligence, like vision and speech and planning and embodied control. And everything has to work together such that the whole that you create is larger, basically, than the sum of the parts. Um, so in today's talk, what I want to do is give you one small sample of research in this space, of recent work we've done in this space, um, that hopefully drives this point home. And then I'm going to actually switch gears and pivot and talk a bit more about some of the challenges that we've encountered over time in this space that I think generalize that are broader than just about situated language, that are about more um, how do we construct these integrative systems. Um, so let's start with language. Uh, well, uh, when people, whoops, this is not. Advancing, of course. Uh, so when people come together to do a situated language, um, they uh, need to manage in parallel and resolve a bunch of different problems. And often we do this without consciously thinking about it. Uh, a first problem we have to resolve is make sure we have an open communication channel. Uh, and this gets regulated in a sort of mixed initiative, fairly complex process we call engagement, where we negotiate how we initiate, how we maintain, and how we get away from interactions. It involves a lot of verbal and nonverbal cues, a lot of things that we implicitly pay attention to. Uh, and we coordinate with each other to solve that. Once we um, have this problem solved, we need to bounce signals to each other. Uh, and that also is coordinated. We don't all talk at the same time. There's this process of turn-taking in conversations. There's, again, this sort of locally coordinated mixed initiative process between people that, again, leverages nonverbal signals uh, and various kinds of cues. Only on top of that, we start recognizing intentions and decoding the meaning behind these signals. That's where speech recognition, language understanding, these various layers come in. And then on top of that, you have to understand that in the context of the entire interaction, integrate that with the discourse history and plan the conversation forward. Uh, so this is almost like a minimal stack of communicative competencies, if you want. Uh, there's, there's different ways to slice and dice this space, but uh, that's one way to think about it. And in the work that we've been doing is we're looking at basically how do we integrate this with the situational context? How do we construct models for these processes that leverage information from the surrounding environment, from what happens around us, the who, the what, and the why of the physical situation? So, 
today what I want to do is give you one small example of, of such a piece of work. And in particular, I'm going to focus on one piece of situational context, which is a participant's attention, where someone is attending while we are speaking. And I'm going to show how that relates to turn taking, um, to, a, to a model of turn taking. This work is inspired by observations made by Goodwin in the 80s on the relationship between these fluencies and attention. Uh, this is work, by the way, with an intern, Joe Yu, at CMU that uh, was an intern with us last year. Um, and so the, the, the starting observation is that we all know that conversational speech is kind of this fluent. There's all these hesitations and ums and uhs, and everyone that does speech recognition knows that if you look at transcripts, they look kind of weird. They look like this, like, it'll be like, anyway, uh, we went, I went to bed, or Brian, you're going to have, you kids will have to go, or I come in, I no sooner sit down on the couch, right? There's all these false starts and restarts and hesitations. And Goodwin's insight was to look at this in relationship to what the listener is doing, and in particular in relationship to what the listener's attention is doing. And so here I have that represented with a red line is when the listener is not looking at the speaker, and the black line is the portion of mutual gaze when the two of them are looking at each other. And so if you look across all of these, it's kind of interesting because there's this pattern that emerges where the last restart, the point from where the utterance becomes grammatical, coincides with a point of mutual gaze. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. And he has uh, a number of other examples where the pattern works in slightly different ways. For instance, here with a, a dotted, uh, you can see this very well, the dotted black line represents a portion where the listener's gaze starts to move towards the speaker. And then the circle is where gaze is reestablished, mutual gaze is reestablished. So again, we have this entire grammatical portion of the sentence that coincides with a portion where someone is driving their attention back. And so with these observations, there's a, there's a, there's a hypothesis that starts forming that maybe these disfluences are not just errors in production. Uh, maybe they actually have to do something with regulating attention and with ensuring mutual ground. I'm going to you know, generate the grammatical sentence while you're looking at me. And maybe the fact that I'm producing these fluencies is going to make you turn back towards me. Now, in contrast to all of this, if you look, so there's, there's very high, in some sense, coordination between people that happens across these channels. Now, in contrast to this, if you look at what we do in typical speech interfaces today, well, in mobile phones, we have these push-to-talk systems where we push a button and we talk. And that makes a lot of sense for those interfaces, for the form factor. Uh, but when you don't have that affordance, uh, in general, in dialogue system, for a long time, there has been this volleyball assumption of you speak, then I speak, kind of of turn taking. And that leads to interaction breakdowns often. And the interaction break breakdowns become even more prominent if you go into multi party settings or if you try and do language in the open world, like with this robot trying to give direction, there's multiple people around. So I'm going to show you one of these examples. Um, uh, of Sue here trying to interact. The, the video you'll see is from the robot's viewpoint. So um, Sue is trying to interact with the robot and try to get information about the conference room she's actually rushing towards. Um, so you'll see what happens. Uh, you need directions. Sorry. Say that again. I'm looking for my meeting. You said Matt McGinley, right? No, give me a minute. Sorry. That was Alberto back L.I. you wanted, correct? That's really wrong. Bye. Well, guess I'll see you later. So apart from the speech recognition errors and those problems, the robot is completely oblivious to the fact that she's looking in her cell phone at this point, trying to find the room number she's trying to get to, and continues kind of contributing in the conversation, trying to get her to say something. Um, and so uh, with this and looking, thinking back of Goodwin's work, uh, we thought, hey, can we build a model where we coordinate speech production incrementally in a better fashion with the attention of the participants in the scene? So we developed this model where the basic idea is a balance between attentional demands and attentional supply. So on one hand, we have attentional demands, which are defined on each phrase, and which specify where do we expect the listener's attention to be at the onset of the phrase, when we're about to start producing the phrase, and throughout the phrase. And we might have different expectations in different parts of the dialogue on different utterances. For instance, uh, in most cases, if I ask you a question, maybe I'll expect you to look at me. But if I tell you about going that way, well, maybe it's OK that you look where I'm pointing, right? So we define these attentional demands. And there's interesting questions about how do you define those. And then on the other hand, we're measuring the attentional supply. We're measuring what really happens with a person's attention. This is based on inference models that leverage deeper down machine learn models that track visual focus of attention based on features from active appearance models and head post trackers and so on. 
But the basic idea is you have these models and when you have a mismatch between what you're expecting and what you're seeing, instead of just producing, blurting something out, you use this coordinative policy where the robot, instead of saying, for instance, to go to 3800, take a left, take a right, it introduces these hesitations on the way. Like, it'll start with a pause if it doesn't have attention. Then it'll say, excuse me, there's still no attention, we'll wait some more. Then maybe we'll launch the first part of the utterance, but not complete it still trying to grab your attention. Eventually, you might get to launch the actual utterance. And at any point in time, if the attention returns, it, it launches the phrase, right? So we have this coordination po policy that induces these disfluences to try to match the attentional supply that, that we observe in the scene. And this is done phrase by phrase. So then we move to the next phrase. So we implemented this in the robot. And to give you a sense of um, sort of how the behavior looks like from the participant's viewpoint, here's a quick demo video that Eric and I shot. something? Yes. Could you tell me the room number or person you're looking for? I think it's uh, 4800. Did you get to 4800? No, no, I think it's 4300. Are you sure? 4300, yeah. Excuse me. 4300. Go along, it. Go along that hallway. I'm looking for 4300. 4300 is just down that hallway and will be the first room on your left. Okay. By the way, would you mind swiping your badge on the reader below so I know who I've been talking with? So now, um, here's from the robot viewpoint, some of the sensing and computation that happens. Um, so the, the kind of blue-greenish line that denotes participant attention is the inferred model of whether my attention is on the system, which is high, or away from the robot, which is low. These are my utterances in blue, and this is a whole phrase that the robot is trying to produce that's being split, and the robot injects these influences on the fly as it observes that my attention is drifting away. I think it's uh, 4,800. To get to 4,800. Excuse me. Go along the, go along that hallway. I'm looking for 4300. 4300 is just down that hallway and will be the first room on your all right, so now this is a demo video that Eric and I had to shoot a couple of times to get right. But here's a few sample natural interactions. So the robot is deployed in front of the elevator bank in our building, and people randomly sort of go and interact with it, some of them just to have fun, some of them to get actual directions. Uh, so here's from a few samples collected from natural interactions. Uh, at the top here, you see what the robot is trying to say uh, with the decomposition into subphrases marked by these vertical bars. And the orange regions are things that are injected on the fly, you know, in the production incrementally in order to coordinate with the attention of the speaker, of the participant, the listener. Uh, so if you pay attention to how these correlate to where people's attentions drift off, you'll get a sense of, of that coordination. Take the elevator down to the second floor. Turn left as you walk out of the elevator and continue on to the end of that hallway. Excuse me. 2800 will be on that side of the building. Huh? Excuse me. Can I... Can I help you find something? Can you tell me? Morning. Do you need directions? Excuse me. Do you need directions? How to get to two, two, two. All right, so uh, lest I've convinced you that we've solved this problem, there's lots of failures. Um, so, um, you know, these are the good cases. But um, inference, making inferences about the physical world in open world setting is very difficult. And so there's a lot of robustness that needs to be created. So I'm going to show you just one example where the world kind of gets crazy. Participants, you know, get close, get far. Uh, system incorrectly infers that they're not attending. And because of that, keeps injecting these interjections, even though they are actually paying attention.
Excuse me, sorry, you wanted 3866, correct? That is right. Excuse me. To yeah. get to 3866, go to the end of that hallway. Go to the end of that hallway. Keep on walking to the end of the corridor. Keep on walking to the end of the corridor. Okay. Turn to uh, the... Oops. Well, guess I'll see you later. We have a special disengagement model there where the robot expresses disappointment when uh, things don't go that well. Uh, but um, hopefully this gives you a sense, I mean, there's a lot of work to do, but it gives you a sense of the kind of coordination and fluidity you might be able to accomplish once you start reasoning about these different dimensions like speech and vision and what happens in the scene with people's attention together. This is but one example in this space, and the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, benefits in some sense uh, can be obtained from this close integration in any of these levels throughout the entire communicative stack. Um, and so while there's a lot of promise, I think, in here in terms of doing multimodal sensing and multimodal integration, over the years that we try to develop these kind of integrative systems that build, uh, that, that bring all these things together, we're also running into a number of challenges. And I want to switch gears now and talk a little bit about some of those, um, as I think some of them generalize to a broader class of systems. They're not necessarily about language. Now, there's different kinds of challenges. Some of them are, for instance, technical, like how do I do multimodal integration with structured data of different times at different time scales. Uh, what I want to focus on today is actually more of a, almost like a, more of an engineering or a science of building integrative systems um, um, kind of problem. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, if we look at some of these challenges, I think part of them have to do with the fact that these systems are just purely complex, like they have many boxes, many components that need to be connected together and talk to each other. If you list all the different kinds of models that are in, you know, that robot system that you just saw, there's all sorts of things from sensing components to inference models to planning components to embodied control components, rendering. So in some sense, we're facing a lot of sort of software engineering challenges in a traditional sense. Uh, but I think it goes beyond that. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting has to do with uh, programming models for coordinated computation. Somehow we develop each of these boxes kind of independently maybe, like someone develops the speech recognizer, someone does the vision system or parts of the vision system, but they somehow need to be coordinated in how they operate. And there are some programming models for coordinated computation, but I think generally that's an interesting um, area also for the future, and generally tools for inspecting and visualizing and understanding what happens in these systems. I think it gets more interesting once you start thinking about the need of these systems to act in real time at low latency and under uncertainty. And so one question that comes into my mind here is, do we maybe need to think a bit more about our programming languages? Do we need to evolve our prog programming languages a, a bit? So two constructs that I've encountered over and over again in these systems are time and uncertainty. And I feel like neither of these are kind of first order citizens in our programming languages. We always have to go implement on top of whatever programming languages we're in support for dealing with time and support for dealing with uncertainty. So I'll make an argument, I don't know, that, that maybe we want these to be first order citizens. Just like I say double F, I want to be able to say stream double F and I want to do anything I can do to a double to F, but I also want to get automatic persistence over time of F. I want to be able to do historical access or sampling over it or compute some operators and transforms over that. And I want that to be baked in deep down almost in the programming language. Um, uncertainty also as a first order citizen. I think everything, uh, a lot of things about AI today are about um, you know, managing uncertainty and you know, representing and uh, doing inference and belief updates. And I wonder if we as a community, as an AI community, should interface more and talk more to the programming languages people and see if there's something to be explored there. Another, I think, uh, point that's really interesting is thinking about how we integrate what, for lack of a better name, I don't know, I'm still looking for, for a better name, is what I would call like human-authored and machine-authored components. What do I mean by that? If you look in these systems, like if you start doing a diagram for one of these robots, uh, what you'll see is there's all these boxes, but some of them are like things that are kind of traditional software boxes where someone writes functions over simple inputs and produce some outputs and they're deterministic and they're unit testable. And peppered throughout all of that, we have various kinds of machine learned models and data-driven models that might have large dimensionality inputs. 
that are not unit testable in a strict sense. Uh, there may be, you might be able to evaluate stochastic in a stochastic manner their accuracy. But it's interesting of how, how do you do the coupling between these systems? And I think coupling this raises interesting questions. Uh, one set of questions I think has to do with the engineering of this integrated system. So let me, let me try and make this concrete and give you an example about this idea of what does it mean to learn in a connected system? So a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms focus on, in one of these boxes, can I get performance up? Can I make this be 30% better or 40% better in accuracy or something like that? But what often happens in the systems is that these things are coupled. And so, for instance, in the attentional models that I just described, the attention model that figures out where is the person, the attention, leverages a lower level model that tracks that attention geometrically, like is it front, left, right, up, down, which in turn leverages scores from a face confidence model that in turn leverages features from a face tracker that I don't even know what model runs inside of it because it's a black box. And so if someone changes something down the stream, that affects the entire stream. And we don't understand well how that all plays out, how to validate that, how to make any sort of guarantees when we architect these systems. So again, just like I said for programming languages, I'm wondering if there's kind of new frontiers here for machine learning at the intersection of machine learning and software engineering. What does it mean to engineer these kinds of systems where I want to be able to plug in various kinds of inference models that are trained by different people at different times in different ways and make them all somehow sing together? Um, Another challenge I think that with respect to learning in these systems is the interactive setting in which these systems often live. Oftentimes machine learning is done in batch, like we have this data set, we keep getting performance higher and higher. But what happens in the systems is you will train a model, you will put it in, that will affect the way the systems behave, which affects the world that the system interacts with, and all of a sudden now your input distribution has shifted. So you're no longer under the right conditions. Um, Another dimension that I think is interesting to think about is the idea of meta-reasoning and uh, system level self-optimization. Um, how do these systems do, uh, can, is there any way for us to do some sort of blame analysis or diagnosis when we have these complex systems? I know at the end of the day something failed. The person ran away and they were frustrated or something. How do I figure out what in the chain worked correctly and what didn't, especially when some of these components are uncertain or stochastic in nature, right? Uh, and then there's interesting questions, I think, about self-optimization and, and self-monitoring. Like, we did some work on, on reasoning about the system's own inferential delays in this pipeline because latency is important for turn-taking. So you want to reason how long will it take me to run this pipeline in order to decide which action you want to take. So I think I'll close it there. The, the last thought that I want to leave you with is that I do think there are interesting challenges in between these areas of machine learning or AI, software engineering, programming languages, and distributed systems. And I think as a community, it would be interesting to reach out to the other communities. I hope we'll hear more in the panel and just generally more discussion on this. Thanks very much, Dan. I failed to mention earlier uh, that there will be a panel discussion on integrative AI um, that will happen right after the break following uh, this more plenary oriented session uh, with, with, with talks. Um, and now we have a, a few minutes for Q&A with Dan. We'll do, we'll do questions and answers after each talk. Um, and uh, so any hands up and we have some runners in the room. And or, or back over here. Wait, wait, wait. It's okay, the, 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 these fellows want to really give you their microphone. Um, it, yeah, I, I, the, the one thing I noticed in your videos was that uh, some of these people are very rude to the robot, and you'd expect them to be. <laughs> and they, they wouldn't act like that way if they were getting directions from, uh, from a human. And so, the, in a sense, the system is dealing with the artificiality that, that is nearly inherent in that human-robot interaction. So I'm wondering, um, I mean, it sounds like a nearly unsolvable problem, right? As, as long as people are confronted with a robot, they'll, they'll treat it like a robot and be particularly rude in, in terms of diverting their attention away, et cetera. I almost feel like I should let Eric answer this question, but I'll say, I'll say a few things to then maybe he can chime in because he's, he's working with me on some of these problems. But uh, so uh, one thing I will say is uh, when I observe, you know, people interacting with the robot, it's actually interesting to see the variability of sort of attitudes and approaches with which people come to the robot. Uh, in some of these videos, indeed, maybe people are, you know, put off or they're rude or they're curt. 
We've also seen cases where people are literally deferential. They won't leave there because the robot doesn't has a bug, doesn't say bye, and they don't want to leave until the <laughs> robot says bye. So we, we've noticed also some of these. And I think what's interesting is people's attitudes, I think, might also change and their, their ability to kind of buy, like, put themselves into, into, the, into the place where they interact with this naturally, I think depends also on the failures of the robot. There are sometimes moments of magic created when everything lines up and everything works perfectly, where people are in this like, oh my god, you know? And then, but the problem is it often fails. Like it, it really, like, you know, more than 50% of the time, there's a problem of one sort or another. My sense is as we sort of reduce the number of errors, you know, it will become also more fluid. So I, I don't think it's hopeless. So, I, and I will, I will, I think, Dan, when our eyes met, I could tell you we're thinking of the same example. We first had fielded the directions robot, uh, and we're looking at videos, and the system discloses that it's videoing people so they understand that and so on for privacy. But it, uh, and they can remove their video by sending an email and so on. But we were looking at the videos, uh, and uh, we noticed there was a professional woman who wasn't from our building, who was dressed very much like she was a visitor and kind of nervous and had her phone out. And she was struggling to find the room, and she gave the room to the robot. It was the wrong room, which didn't exist, and the robot was struggling. And she finally goes, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, like looking very, like, sorrowful, and gave the robot the actual correct room. And the robot gave her the great answer, and she ran off because she was very rushed. She came running back and said, thanks. <laughs> like, you know, it's just really impressive how people personify uh, and imbue humanness. And even, you can just see in her mind, her, her mom maybe, when she was a kid, saying, you always thank people when they help you. Running back to you know, say thank you to the robot. Um, one, one comment, by the way, I want to make on this work that Dan presented. Uh, we had a great time working with, with Zhao Yu from CMU on this, an intern. Uh, uh, we double in size uh, every year by our intern load coming in across Microsoft campuses. So we really adore and have long-lasting relationships with the interns from all the departments of, uh, of all your departments. So uh, any other questions for Dan? Um, so, Dan, I really like the talk. Thank you. Um, well, I think both parts of the talk were great. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about attention and turn-taking. Mm -hmm. So you have these nice... so. It's great to see you working on kind of how production connect. So how do you kind of systematically or um, generate disfluencies at relevant places? And you have nice examples where disfluencies related to the coordination of attention. Um, but there can be other sources of disfluencies. So things like, uh, you know, lexical access problem in mm -hmm. the speaker. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, like, do you feel like you have a grip on how to connect uh, potentially using data, the places where it makes sense to generate disfluencies um, based on, you know, potentially coordinating attention or other kinds of factors that are at play in these uh, interactions? The short answer is no. Uh, the, 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 the longer answer is, I, I do think, I mean, I completely agree with you, not all these fluencies are about coordinating attention, you know, and it's not clear how many of them even are. I think one thing that's interesting is, you know, these observations from Goodwin was, were based on certain, you know, probably very small kind of samples. Uh, it's interesting to think, I, I feel like we should do more of observing with today's technology, human-human interactions, and trying to get to better understand exactly this, you know, these things that you're describing, you know, how much comes from where, and what's a model that kind of unifies these different, uh, these different branches. There's also connections between this, I feel, that also we really don't understand at all, and were highlighted when we build this stuff, for instance, between how this and gesture works, right? Like if I, how do I generally, if I'm pointing there, can a disfluency be even generated? Like, you know, so there's, I think the, the story gets composed with extra dimensions, and we haven't explored those, but I think, yeah, oh, it's certainly interesting. Okay, one last question for Dan. Yeah, so uh, you might have read Justice already, I didn't, I didn't hear it, but uh, does the system have any understanding of the reasons why the uh, interlocutor's attention might be elsewhere, you know, either he or she is looking for information or talking to the companion or engaging in other activities, say driving, for example? So it depends on how you mean reason. So we have a set of targets defined in the environment. So the system understands that, for instance, if someone's looking there when I'm pointing there, like it has that level of understanding that that's an OK thing or that's an expected target, you know. But this is all pretty fine for this domain. Like it's not a more gener general model of, you know. Uh, the system also has an understanding on in multi-party settings when there are multiple people around of who's engaged with it and who's engaged, you know, 
uh, we're not leveraging that right now, but definitely that should also be leveraged. Like, you know, do I understand that, hey, your attention is on the other person because you're making a joke or because, you know, you're actually asking them which room you need to go to. All of these distinctions we need to be in. Right now it's, in some sense, quite simplistic. It's just a set of targets that are semantically defined corresponding to this domain. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, next, Larry, come on up. <clears throat> um, and you've heard about Larry before, and this, we should just dive right in. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so, um, so today, what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to continue this theme of integrative AI, but I'm going to be taking a, a bit of a different angle. I'm not going to be talking about robots at all or anything like that, because I know. <laughs> you think. But uh, I, I haven't worked much in robots, so we're not going to talk about robots. But what I am going to do is talk about how we integrate vision, language, and common sense. And how I want to begin is to discuss what does it mean to understand? And understand is like this, it's a really loaded term, I think, in AI, and I think there's been a lot of controversy about what does it mean to truly understand something. And if we have an algorithm and we feel like it doesn't deeply understand the problem, people will always go, ah, that's, that, that's not true AI. That doesn't really understand what's going on at a deep level like a human does. So let's just have a couple examples of understanding. So does anybody in this room believe that a computer cannot understand the concept of red? cannot understand the concept of red. See, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, you take, a, you take a computer, it knows the lexicon, it knows red, right? And then it, you can stick a camera on it, and it will learn that when the red photoreceptors fire, that this means red. And that is the same type of deep understanding that we as humans have, right? So we can understand, give it to us, give it to us. <laughs> I know, you can, you can make arguments about red wine or uh, red-faced, you know, but I'm talking about the concept of just the color red. You know, we understand that. I think we can give it to computers that they understand red. <laughs> we'll debate it later, maybe in the uh, panel session. Uh, but what about something like this? What, is a sheep fluffy? If you went to yesterday's sessions, you could see that, well, if we want to learn common sense knowledge, we go out onto the web. We could learn that the word fluffy co-occurs with the word sheep a lot, right? And you could say, well, yeah, sheep are fluffy, because that's what I've seen a lot. But do you understand really what fluffy means? You could go one step further. You could give it an image, too, and say, this is a sheep, and it's fluffy. And you could give this to a computer vision algorithm and say, oh, I understand what the visual um, incarnation of fluffy is. But then you show it another image like this, and it's going to say, oh, look, a fluffy tree. You know? So if it, you see the computer it doesn't have a deep enough understanding of what the true meaning of fluffy is. So what we really need is robots going around with little touch sensors on them to understand what it means to actually be fluffy, if you really want a deep understanding of fluffiness. But it's not true that you can just take a robot, put it into the world with every type of sensor you could imagine, and it will understand deeply what everything means. There's other concepts, I believe, which are not as easily understood, such as angry. You know, uh, you know if you want to have a first-person interpretation of angry, you know, hopefully our computers in no time soon really understand angry from a first-person interpretation, uh, unless we're going to be in trouble. We don't want angry computers running around and, and being mean to us. All right. So there's all these like, different types of levels of understanding and how we can understand. And the more that we integrate multiple signals, the better maybe we can understand. Now what I want to do is I want to do a little case study. And I want to talk about understanding specifically in the realm of Im image captioning. And I think this is interesting for two reasons. One is that yesterday you guys heard a lot about image captioning. So I think we're kind of all on the same page of where image captioning is now. And the second thing is I think image captioning really captures why uh, you know, it, it captures the imagination. Because if you can describe an image, that means that you really, I mean, we interpret that as really being able to understand what that image is about. We understand that, we understand what the humans are that have to understand that interpretation. We must understand what, deeply what's in that image. We must understand the, the scenario that's going around. And it, it really just, you know, in theory, if we really did do image description correctly, we would need this very deep understanding. So if we do image captioning, the standard pipeline is just you have vision, you extract out some visual features, you have some sort of representation, and then you spit out a sentence. And a good incarnation of this is something that Oriol Vignal did, where uh, you have an image, you have some deep learning algorithm like a CNN, and then you throw in an RNN like an LSTM like this, and it just spits out a sentence. And if you take a, an example, so there's a lot of groups that all showed really great results simultaneously. This is a result from the MSR paper. And you look at this caption, a man standing next to a fire hydrant in front of a brick building. And if you look at this caption and you look at that image, it's amazing. 
I mean, you understand that this is a man, he's standing, he's next to a fire hydrant. He is in front of a brick building. I, you, I mean, from a computer vision perspective, where you're, you're, you know, your level of expectation is somewhere near your feet, and it does that well, you're just blown away. And I think there were graduate students jumping up and down across the US when they were first running their algorithms uh, you know, on these, this captioning data. And they were actually producing something reasonable. So why is this? Why, why were they doing so well? Did they have a deep understanding? Well, there was a little bit of a red flag, I think, in some of these results, which kind of went unnoticed initially, which is that depending on the algorithm, 35 to 85% of the generated, generated captions were word for word the same as a caption in the training data. What does this mean? You, that the, exact, the caption is exactly the same as the training data. Does it mean that we're really understanding these captions if all we're doing is borrowing captions from the training data and slapping them onto the images in the test data? So in order to test this theory, what we did is we said, let's just train a nearest neighbor classifier. So we have a test image, it comes in, we find a bunch of training images which look very similar to it in some uh, visual space that's trained to be, you know, match images which are semantically similar. We then take those images and we take all the training captions that come along with them. We find which of those captions is closest in blue score, or CIDR score, or which is most similar to the other sentences in that list. And we basically pick that sentence out and that's our caption. Right? The very simple baseline, all you need to do is match images to images. How well does this do? Well, here's some qualitative examples. We have a black and white cat sitting in a bathroom sink. It's pretty impressive. It's even more impressive that there's an image in the training example which looks exactly like that. Uh, and then you have two you know, zebras and a giraffe in a field. Not perfect, but not bad. And if you look at automatic evaluation metrics and you look at where nearest neighbor is, it's near the top, it's middle of the top, depending on which evaluation metric you're using. And this is better than many of these you know, deep learning algorithms. And it makes you question how much these RNNs are doing and how much more work we have to do in the future. So why does nearest neighbor work? This is, I think, counterintuitive to a lot of our beliefs. This is, you think about the space of images, it's massive, it's huge. How could nearest neighbor possibly work in generating captions? Well, in order to understand this, we need to know, understand the data set a little bit. So we have the, uh, all these results are basically on the MS COCO uh, data set, which, has, which was originally built for segmentation and detection, so at 80 different object categories. Uh, has 160,000 images, a lot of segmentations, and we talked about this uh, yesterday a little bit. This data set is a part of a large collaboration amongst many, many people. Uh, a lot of the credit goes to Sung Yi Lin, who is the student behind this. He's really done a, just a huge amount of work on it. Uh, Peter Dollar, one of, uh, our collaborator on this, he's done a lot of work as well. So let's go back and let's look at one of these fantastic captions. A man riding a wave on a surfboard in the water, right? Just nailed it, perfect, awesome. Like it's the water, he's, he's riding, he's on the wave. You know, the level of understanding's gotta be there. But now let's look at the training data, and let's look at the images which lie close to that image. You know, that caption works pretty well for pretty much all of those as well. Now, let's look at all of the training images in MS Coco. This is a video of every single image in the training data set, ordered by semantic similarity. And what you'll notice is that for many, many images, there's a lot of other images which look very, very similar. So I can make up a sentence as I go along, a street side along a uh, road, a watchtower, <laughs> a watchtower with a brick building, a, a white bathroom with a white toilet and white sink, uh, a living room which is messy, two laptops on top of a table, you know, et cetera, right? So you can see how this could work. Now, if you were skeptical, uh, and you know, as, as computer science researchers we generally are, you would say, well, this is just a, a, a fact of the data set. You just collected this data set wrong. You have too many images which are similar. And we specifically set out in creating this data set to have diverse images, to have images which did have a lot of contextual information, which did have a lot of objects in them, which, did, uh, were, which weren't simple and easy images. But it turns out that this property of the Microsoft Cocoa data set is not just a property of the Microsoft Cocoa data set. It's actually a property of our real world. So there's this, uh, has anybody seen this video online? Anybody in computer video, this, this, this is, you should go watch the full video, it's really awesome. So this is, they have a bunch of videos, and they basically make up words 
to describe different concepts. And this concept, the word is vimodalin. You should just search for that. And the concept is the frustration of photographing something amazing when thousands of identical photos already exist. Right? You think you were cool when you took that photo. You're not. <laughs> Somebody else has already taken that photo. You're not as cool as you think you are. We as humans, we think too much alike. And nothing shines more of a light on that than when you go to Flickr and you look at the images and you're like, ah, yeah, we are all very similar. And the video that I showed you earlier of the Coco data set, I have the exact same video with random Flickr images and the same property holds. You can look at it. You look for it. They're both on YouTube. So you can go check it out on YouTube. All right. So if you're thinking about it from a product standpoint, let's say you're a Microsoft of the world or Google or Facebook of the world, this is fine. You get 2 billion images uploaded a day. We can actually caption them all using these kind of nearest neighbors approaches. If they work, they work. Who cares? Right? But as AI researchers, we're kind of like, eh, I actually do want to deeply understand things. I don't want to, I don't want to cheat because, you know, I don't want my, my fellow researchers to say, Larry, all you do is cheat. Uh, and, you, you, you know, and even publishing nearest neighbor stuff, we put it out on archive, but we wouldn't expect it to actually be accepted into a real conference. But yesterday we did see some works which actually tried to go into a deeper understanding. We had the MSR paper, and then also Rich Zemmel has a really nice paper where they not only just look at the entire image, but they also try to look at subregions of the image and see where is the teddy bear, where is the person, you know, where this, these specific objects are. What I want to talk about is another piece of work that I did with Shin Lei Chen, who's a student from CMU uh, of Abhinav's Guptas. He's just a fantastic student, and a project that we called Mind's Eye. Now, if you think, if you hear a written description or you read a written description, you don't just read it. You don't just understand the words. You actually try to picture what's going on when you read that description as you're understanding it. And this, 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 this visualization of the description in your head is actually critical to understand the words as you're reading them. So for instance, you could read a sentence like, a girl and a boy, picture a girl and a boy, knock, you might picture them knocking on the door, and then you down the tower, and then they you know, knock down a tower, right? So we all have, might have different visualizations, but you know, we all visualize something. Now, when you think of this, what this does is it takes not just this one-way interpretation, but you have to go both ways, back and forth, from vision representation language and then back. And the way we did this is we took your kind of generic RNN model, which you have visual features coming in, you have a hidden state, which is the S, the uh, white area, and then the green, which is like the output of the words, and we stuck another layer on top of this where we took the words and from the words tried to reconstruct the visual features again. So one way to think of this is as, a, is, is as an autoencoder in which a sentence is in between. So you try to reconstruct the visual features using the sentence. And what's cool about this is you can actually kind of tap in to the hidden states and see what the network is thinking as it's reading a sentence. So if you look at this example, Mike is holding a baseball bat. And as soon as you say baseball, the baseball glove lights up, the bat lights up, the ball lights up, the baseball cap lights up. So you can see, as you say baseball, all these things light up. Just as in a human, it would light up, because you'd picture an entire scene in your head. Here's another example. When you say hot, the hot air balloon lights up, the hot dog lights up. And then when you say hot dog, the hot dog lights up, the hot air balloon turns off, dog never lights up. And then when you say hot dog, also the hamburger lights up, because a lot of times hamburgers and hot dogs co-occur. The grill, the table, et cetera, light up as well. So now I want to talk about limitations a little bit. So here we have a caption, or here an image, a crazy zebra climbing a giraffe to get a better view. Now if you think about, I mean this is a great caption, right? And, this, and you think about how, to, if, if you could generate this caption, it'd be amazing. But what would you need to do to do it, right? So if you, let's say you want to figure out that you want a climbing zebra detector. You're going to have a really hard time. For first off, there exist two images on the web of zebras climbing. This is one of them. Uh, and if you've been paying attention to the deep learning, that's not enough training data. And, and if you do language modeling, you think about it, if you say zebra climbing, the language model is going to be screaming at you, do not say this, do not say this, do not say this. I've read the entire web and nobody's ever, ever said zebra climbing. You should not say this. And it won't let you say it, right? So we have these problems. This is the limits to the vision and the language models that we have today. Here's another example. A man is rescued from his truck that is hanging dangerously from a bridge. This image is awesome. You look at this image, it's a single moment in time. But if I asked each and every one of you to describe the three hour sequence which surrounded this image, you would probably all have a very similar story. 
The guy drove across the bridge. He crashed. He ran off. He was, I mean, you know, fell off the bridge. He was really scared. So people ran up to him. They ran, lowered a rope. They you know, pulled him back up. Everybody cheered. And you know, it, was, it was a happy day after all for everyone. Right? But to even have that of a deep of a level of understanding, you need to know so much about the world. You need to have a lot of common sense knowledge to understand that that truck could have fallen at any moment and killed the guy. That's why it's dangerous. That because it was dangerous and because he actually is being hauled up right now, he's being rescued. A word like rescued is really hard to detect and really hard to understand. And here's another example. Probably most of you have seen this photo. So this, is, this, is a, this photo is just by itself, is, is just, it's, it's a really, it really captures you. you know, it's, it's a really impactful photo just by itself. But if you understand the story behind this photo and what it represents, it takes on a whole new meaning. If you understood that this is representing the poverty during the Great Depression, and this is really indicative of basically the, the whole era in United States history, this photo has a much bigger meaning. But you cannot understand that, you cannot grasp that without this additional knowledge. It's not common sense knowledge, but it's knowledge that we have. So we really shouldn't be thinking of this problem as vision, representation, language. We really need to be thinking of this problem as vision, language, common sense, knowledge, representation. There's probably even more. I'm a vision guy, so people might want to do touch or uh, you know, smell, hearing, all the other things. But you, know, you can add them in. But it needs to be holistic. It needs to be considering all of these elements. But this is, I think, where we commonly get stuck. Because once you start thinking, we need common sense, we need vision, we need language, this is so challenging. Because we are, you know, historically, many of us you know, have been kind of siloed. We've either been computer vision researchers or NLP researchers or machine learning or you know, whatever, researchers. And it's like, how do, how, do, how do we even begin working on this? How do we begin taking a more holistic approach? And what I want to do is just talk about two projects which I think begin to kind of pull us in that direction. So the first thing I want to talk about is abstract scenes. So this is uh, just a whole body of work. It's done a minute, most of it with uh, Debbie Parikh, a, a longtime collaborator of mine, her students, a bunch of students from CMU. And the premise of the work is as follows. If we really want to understand you know, common sense knowledge about the world, semantics, do we really need to understand things at the pixel level? You know, you think about semantics, you think about words, you think about uh, common sense knowledge, you don't need to understand it at the pixel level. You can just understand it at a more abstract level. You could understand it, you know, basically from cartoons. How many of you understand that people get eaten by bears because you've seen somebody get eaten by a bear? Very few of you, well, hopefully uh, very few of you, right? Uh, however, maybe you've seen a cartoon of it, or maybe you visualize it in your head, or maybe, uh, you know, you've seen other things being eaten by bears, like salmon. Uh, and extrapolated from that, who knows. But if you take cartoons, and let's say you have a very diverse set of cartoons where you have uh, whole sorts of different people, different ages, different poses, uh, you have all sorts of different things that they can play with and all sorts of animals that they can interact with. And then you go to Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turks are awesome. They're my favorite people in the world. Uh, they come out and you say, drag and drop interface, and they basically create scenes like these. And you just look at diversity. Some of them are funny, some of them are boring, uh, but they really just generally just depict everyday world scenes. And from these, you can induce a lot of knowledge about our world. And there's a lot of really cool things you can do with abstract scenes that you can't do with real images. For instance, you can have a mechanical turker create a scene like this one here. You have another mechanical turker come in and describe the scene. And then from that description, you go back to mechanical turk and you say, generate another scene which depicts this description. So you can get in it a description like Mike fights off a bear by giving him a hot dog while Jenny runs away. And then you get six different mechanical turkers to create depictions of that scene. And you notice the diversity, yet how dissimilar they are. You get to learn what it means to give away. Usually you're not happy about giving away something. You learn what it means to get, you know, run away. You learn what you know, a bear is. You know, all these sort of different things from this diversity. So you can learn things that are kind of subtle, that are harder to learn otherwise. Like, what's the difference between running after something and running to something? Probably most of you haven't really thought about it. You just kind of take it for granted. But you know, running after something means that you're running, the other person is running as well. And when you run to somebody, they're probably just standing there. And then there's other things that we don't necessarily think of as visual, but have visual interpretations, like want and watch. It turns out that if you want something, you're basically looking at it. 
And if you watch something, you're also looking at it. So visually, want and watch are actually very similar. Even laughing at is very similar, because usually when you're laughing at something, you are also watching it. All right. So the final thing I want to talk about is visual question answering. So what I just talked about was one way of gathering common sense knowledge, or one way of gathering knowledge about the world. But one thing, if you really want to drive the community towards more holistic problems, towards integrative AI, we need to have challenges which are integrative, which do combine multiple modalities, and which do require uh, a very diverse set of knowledge. And I think this is what has me excited about visual question answering. And this work, again, is done with Debbie Parikh, Drew Batra, and many other students at Virginia Tech. So visual question answering, what you do is you have an image, you have some questions, and the goal is to answer the questions. The questions are open-ended. We went to Mechanical Turk and said, stump a smart robot. Give us a question that can stump a smart robot. And then we went back and this collected answers. It's open-ended answers, open-ended questions. So it's very diverse. So, and then the interesting thing is it doesn't just require knowledge about the images or the language. You also need knowledge about common sense information. Like, does this person have 20-20 vision? What does having 20-20 vision mean? It means you have to have glasses. Or you don't need glasses, right? Uh, or is this a vegetarian pizza? Or the one on the far, which, which I like, was we, had, we labeled abstract scenes as well, which is, is this person expecting company? Now, that's an interesting question. Is this person expecting company? Well, there's two wine, we, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's two wine glasses on the pitna cloth. So obviously he's expecting company, or he likes drinking a lot. It's hard to tell. Uh, all right. And if you look at the diversity of questions that people ask, it's amazing. So this is the, an illustration of the first three or four words of all the questions in our entire data set. So if you read it from inside out, so you can say, like, is this A? How many people are? Does the? What color is the? What is the man? And there's a huge diversity in the type of questions. And the type of answers each of these have is diverse as well. You, know, you can have a lot of yes and no questions. You can have counting questions. You can have color questions. You can have what sport is this? You can have uh, arbitrarily complex questions. Surprisingly, the yes and no questions have a tendency to be harder than the other ones. And this data set, is, we're probably going to release our first beta. We have a um, kind of alpha, kind of taster release out there right now if you want to check it out. We're going to be releasing a beta release, which will have 120,000 images with 360,000 questions and 3.6 million answers. It's going to be a huge data set, and that's going to be released in the next couple weeks. And then we're going to have a full release coming out this fall with uh, all of the, which is going to be on all of the uh, Microsoft Coco images, plus another set of random Flickr images for greater diversity, plus 50,000 abstract scenes. So it should be a really large, hopefully really interesting data set. And it really allows us to get at vision, language, common sense together. It's, an, it's something that can be easily evaluated, which doesn't have some of the problems that we had with the image captioning task. We don't even know how to evaluate the task. So we're really excited about this. So in conclusion, I think it's really, you know, when we start thinking about this integrative AI, you know, it's, it's a challenge as researchers not to only think of how do we create systems which can do integrative AI, but how do we pose challenges which do all of this? How do we create data sets from which we can learn from this? And it's like, the, if you look at it holistically, it's an amazing, rich, and amazingly interesting space. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any questions for Larry? Maybe I'll start with one. Um, you ask a, a large population of individuals to think about st stumping a smart robot, and depending on who people are and their backgrounds, or even by stochastics, have different sense for what that means. Um, how would the, is, are you thinking of characterizing or clustering those kinds of QA uh, challenges by notions of difficulty with regards to some standard or some information theoretic measure? So what we've done is we've, we've done some clustering on the question type, and you can cluster based upon the first few words of the, the question, and that does actually kind of cluster similar ones together. Now, one interesting question is, how do you know whether common sense knowledge is required to answer the question? You know, if you say, how many chairs are there in the room? That doesn't really require common sense knowledge, right? Where the, you know, the 2020 vision one does. Now, what, is, what I, we haven't been able to quite figure out yet is, how do you tease apart those questions. How do you measure how much common sense or how much knowledge is needed to answer these? And that way we could actually split them up by difficulty. Anybody has any ideas, <laughs> let us know. Uh, and I, I think it'd be great to do a Mechanical Turk task to do that, but I, we haven't quite figured out the right way yet. OK, we're here. Ken? Hi, Larry. This, uh, really great talk, wonderful stuff. 
I was wondering, have you thought about using abstract images to try to build up models of the spatial semantics of prepositions? I mean, there's a lot of mm -hmm. work on cross-linguistic stuff and learning them, but being able to actually have participants generate their own scenarios, which none of the existing methods do right now, might actually be much more revealing. So what we've done, so we, we've done various explorations in this, and what we've explored is what we call relations. So that actually includes uh, verbs, prepositions, like next to, running after. We kind of group them all together. You know, NLP people might yell at us, but you know, basically it's a relationship of one object to the other. And we've done, we've done a, some trying to detect what relationship exists. But we also have another paper where we can get sentences just describing a scene, and then we try to render a scene depicting those sentences. And for that, you need to understand these relationships. So we actually, the models that, re, that model these relationships are still fairly naive. They're just Gaussian mixture models of the spatial locations of these objects, as well as their attributes, like is a person running, which direction are they facing? You know, because gaze, which direction are they looking, is very important for many of these things. So we've done that. Now, where I'd like to go is more into the temporal. We've done initial studies in temporal. We've you know, had asked Turkers to actually create sequences of scenes. But we're just, I mean, just scratching the surface. You know? and, then, and if you just ask Turkers to do this, it, well, it's an incredibly rich space. But yeah, we, we really have just scratched the surface of it. I think there's a lot more you could do. OK, question. Yeah, this is just a query from an academic interest point of view. Do we have a formal definition of what is common sense, even from a visual perception or vision point of view, and how much of that overlaps knowledge? It's a good question, because what is common? Common sense is common knowledge. You know, and I think, I think it was Lucy who showed it yesterday, which said, you know, common knowledge, knowledge that is common sense is knowledge that I assume that you have and that you assume I have. Right? But that can change. You know, culturally, common sense knowledge varies. Right? And age, that, that varies as well. In order to communicate, we need to understand what our common knowledge base is. Right? And you know, as, even as researchers, we, our common sense knowledge relative to the two of us is also varies. So I think the, the term common sense is not something that's global. It's actually you have to define your population. And then given your population, then you can then define what the common sense knowledge is. Right? And it, it's, it, there's a big gray area between that and uh, you know, just generic knowledge. Sometimes we say that uh, uh, common sense is, is this incredibly uh, copious, massive amount of information about the world that's not in the dictionary anywhere. It's just assumed. Um, Candace, uh, Candace uh, had a question over here. Do you see her? But for the TV audience, though, they need to hear you. <laughs> So I noticed that among your missing words for questions was why. Mm -hmm. Does it occur in your data set very much? It's the hardest of the, why, of the questions to deal with. Why? You know, we did bias the data set towards questions that could be answered with just a few words to make the evaluation easier. And when you get to why, why is usually a long answer, <laughs> and the most annoying one for three-year-olds uh, in dealing with them. Uh, but no, I agree with you. There's not as much why. So that, that is a good question. And, and since it is a longer term, you know, since the answers are generally more are longer, maybe that's a good area for future research. And I think for mechanical turkers, we could even prime them to say, ask a question that's a why question. Imagine you're a three-year-old and you wanted to ask a question about this image. And you could do that. That's a good, that's a good idea. I like that. So, so beyond how, we're probably all here because of why, and we'll end with that. Thanks, Larry. Thank you.